we're just going to we're just going to be a couple of minutes. We're waiting for a French interpreter. So that's what we're waiting on right now. So it'll be just a small delay. Looks like they're almost set up up there, so. could do play by play for a little while while I watch the interpretation booth. When there's two people in there, that seems like that's a problem. But now <laughs> it looks like we're getting, we're just about ready to go. I'll ask the two interpreters to give me a thumbs up when you're ready. We got thumbs up on both sides. Looks like we're ready to go. That, that was quick. That was good scrambling. Um, welcome, everybody, to the Addressing Holistic Needs Through Education uh, parallel event, um, or as we're calling it, a whole bunch of important things and only 45 minutes to discuss them. So um, it's going to be interesting to moderate, but we did do a practice session yesterday, and it was uh, very, very uh, smooth. My name is Mike Lake. I'm a Conservative Member of Parliament from Canada, and uh, I'm really honored to have been entrusted to moderate this, this important panel, because uh, I did have a chance to hear what our panelists are going to say yesterday as we worked through this, and it was, it was fantastic. You're in for uh, a real treat, uh, stories shared by some really wonderful people. A um, couple of housekeeping things. First of all, translation. You'll probably need translation. If, if you don't speak English, French, and Russian, you will need translation. And so there's headsets there. Um, just a little cheat, because the, the, the microphones aren't the same or the headsets aren't the same in every room. It's the fourth button sort of from the left that cycles through um, the different languages. So you might want to try that so you're prepared. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping there. And, uh, and I'm going to sort of jump right in as part of my intro. So my sort of reason for being here and my motivation really centers around uh, my kids. So I have a 27-year-old son who has autism, and his name's Jaden, and I have a 23-year-old daughter who's in law school um, back in Canada, in Edmonton, where I live. And uh, um, they are my motivation. I, they have had a fantastic experience through their education. Um, my son has been fully included um, right from kindergarten to grade 12 in the school system where he's from, and I want Every, every child in the world to have the same opportunities that my son and daughter have had. And so that's my motivation. And to lead things off for me, I'm going to share a two-minute video that 
uh, introduces you to Jaden and what inclusion has looked like, part of what inclusion has looked like in his world. The cast members of Bye Bye Birdie loosen their vocal cords with a classic scale. But their rehearsal isn't complete without one more exercise, a run they've come to know as Jaden's warm up. They sing ba 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 because it's the only sound 17 year old Jaden makes. The grade 11 student has autism and is nonverbal. You only need to watch one number to see Jaden is like any other cast member. He's just performing with the help of a buddy system. We just uh, hold his hand um, to guide him which place to go and um, if he's going off somewhere we watch over him and uh, yeah he's like a brother. Jaden has always loved music. The sound of music is one of his favorites and his visual memory is so strong choreographers know once they teach Jaden certain steps they can't make any changes. Whatever you teach Jaden you're not going to be able to go back and say hey by the way can you now do this because that first thing that we teach him is the thing that sticks in his mind. Jaden's parents see changes in him. How content he is being part of the cast. I think he just loves being part of a group of kids. You know, everybody likes to be part of a group even if they can't verbalize it, right? Being part of the group, Jaden is enhancing his peers' performance too. He's the fun person to be with. Um, he also encourages the other cast, just high-fiving everyone. And so, in just a few months, without singing a single word, Jaden has taught these students something his teacher wants them to remember long after curtain call. They can just stop and go, you know what, there is a value to absolutely every person. And when you accept someone unconditionally, you allow them to shine too. So that is, uh, that's what inclusions look like in our life, a very personal story there. And I will point out, when we put Jaden in a regular classroom and worked so hard to make that happen, we did that thinking it was going to be great for him, and it was great for him. But when he graduated, when you talk to the students that went to school with him, they would all say that their life was immeasurably better because Jaden was included in their classroom too. And that's an outcome, an unexpected outcome for us. Now, um, we've had a great day. We had a great day yesterday with lots of fantastic announcements, and so we want to build on that today. We have this wonderful panel with a lot of people who have some great things to say, so we'll jump right to it. My hope is that the spirit of today sort of uh, encapsulates what JFK said when he said, things do not happen, things are made to happen. And that's what I kind of want the spirit of today to be. As you listen to these wonderful speakers, I hope that you'll think about the, the action that is inspired by that and think about where we go after this great day that we had yesterday with all the money announced and turn that funding into meaningful action for people that uh, need it. So uh, without further ado, what I'm gonna do is introduce, to start things off, um, a true leader. And I've had the opportunity to hear this uh, gentleman speak a few times over the past couple of days. Uh, His Excellency Ibrahim Natatu is the Minister of National Education of the Republic of Niger, appointed in 2022. So we'll welcome the Honourable Minister right now to say a few words. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, chers participants, à vos titres, qualité et grade. C'est avec un grand plaisir que je prends la parole devant ce parterre d'éminentes personnalités à l'occasion de cet important événement pour introduire des échanges et des discussions sur la dimension multisectorielle de l'éducation en situation d'urgence. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, qu'il me soit permis de prime abord de saluer et de remercier l'ensemble des participants ici présents pour l'intérêt accordé à la recherche de solutions aux grands défis de l'éducation dans le monde d'aujourd'hui. En effet, il est désormais admis de tous que l'éducation à travers le monde en général et les pays en développement comme le Niger en particulier traverse une crise sans précédent. 
Cette crise dont les causes sont multiples est accentuée ces dernières années par des chocs exogènes, notamment climatiques, sécuritaires, mais aussi sanitaires. Les répercussions de ce choc sur l'éducation ont été malheureusement très sévères et de plus désastreux per perturbant ainsi son fonctionnement normal et habituel. C'est ainsi que les changements et innovations adaptés pour rendre l'éducation plus résiliente aux effets des différents chocs ont créé le besoin de remettre en cause, entre autres, l'approche philosophique et technologique de notre éducation, les relations avec les institutions éducatives grâce à l'interconnexion et surtout les compétences à enseigner en réponse aux besoins du marché du travail de demain. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, s'il est bien vrai que des stratégies et des approches innovantes existent pour adapter l'éducation dans ce monde en crise, il n'en demeure pas moins qu'une attention particulière doit être accordée à des besoins spécifiques et à des catégories de personnes vulnérables pour raisons d'équité, de justice sociale et d'efficacité. Il s'agit de répondre à des besoins globaux grâce à l'éducation, notamment sur la santé mentale et le soutien psychosocial, l'inclusion du handicap, l'atténuation de la violence liée au genre, ainsi que l'alimentation scolaire dans le cadre de l'éducation en situation d'urgence. Prendre fait et cause pour l'apprentissage précoce, notamment par la prise en compte de la petite enfance en offrant un apprentissage précoce fondé sur le jeu dans les situations d'urgence ou de crise prolongée. Si promouvoir l'égalité des genres et l'autonomisation des filles dans et par l'éducation, notamment en mettant au centre des préoccupations la question de l'égalité des genres et l'autonomisation des femmes et des filles dans les situations d'urgence ou de crise prolongée, ainsi que sur les défis structurels à relever pour y parvenir. Telles sont, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, les thématiques sur lesquelles nous sommes appelés à échanger dans quelques instants. Sur ce, tout en nous souhaitant des échanges fructueux, je déclare ouverts les travaux de ces séances parallèles. Je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Minister. Um, now it's time to zoom in on the topic of school meals. Uh, we'll hear from David Beasley, Executive Director of the World Food Program, one of the ECW grantees, and Ifanye from the ECW Youth Constituency. So Ifanye, the first question goes to you. What makes providing school meals particularly important in emergency settings? Um, thank you very much for that question. Um, school meals is very, very important. And to quantify this is just as how a fuel is to a car. That is how school meals is to education. It is the fuel booster. It is the driver of education. Now, um, being someone that work at the field level, we have seen evidence that these people, children, people in refugee settings, IDP camps, eat once in a day. Just imagine you taking a meal, maybe a coffee in a day throughout your life. We have seen cases in Uganda, in South Sudan, in Nigeria, where children, food distribution is low because of the war in Ukraine and even COVID-19. So people are struggling to feed their family, even getting to distribute food at the refugee level. So it is terrible to see that there is food reduction, there is no food, there is malnutrition, these children are hungry, then you tell them to learn without eating. Now, talking about school meals, at the continental level, we have what we call the homegrown school feeding program. This is something that can be scaled up to reach people in emergency settings. It is very, very important that we consider feeding these children while they learn. Apart from being hungry, school meals is the only motivation for parents to send their children to school. When a parent knows that, oh, my son is going to eat while schooling, why would education be a problem? At the end of the day, we are the ones to benefit from it because an educated child is a transformed nation. 
With this, um, I have asked uh, Mr. David Basley a question. So I will ask this question now and we'll hear his answer. To what food program? What food program is the lead guarantee for Education Can No Wait Multi-Year Program in, in Niger? How does school feeding contribute to learning and educa education outcomes in this program? Over to you, David. As we have seen in our lifetimes, and right now 349 million people around the planet are marching towards starvation and over 200 million more than before the pandemic. And 49 million of them are right on the brink of famine, knocking on famine's door. Niger, for example, like many countries in the Sahel region, is bearing the brunt of this crisis and children and young people are suffering the most. For many, a meal at school is the only meal they receive all day. And it can be an important incentive for families to keep their children in school. This is especially important for girls who are still more likely to drop out of school to support their families with work, marriage, or raising young children. So I'm pleased the government of Niger has made school feeding programs a national priority. Thank you, Niger. And this commitment is already delivering impressive results with school attendance rates rising by more than 7% so far. And it's not just the children who benefit. Well, in Niger, school meals programs produce economic returns of almost $7 for every $1 invested, supporting local farmers and strengthening local economies. At WFP, uh, we're proud to partner with Education Cannot Wait and the government of Niger to build a stronger, brighter future for children and communities all across the country. And we're also working together as part of the Global School Meals Coalition, which offers an inspiring vision of the future. WFP, we are fully committed to collaborating with partners around the world to bring it to life. Together, we can and we will succeed in giving every child, no matter where they live, the opportunity to enjoy a nutritious school meal and the chance to learn, grow, and thrive. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Give him a round of applause. Thanks, Afanye and David. And uh, now we're going to turn to another important issue. And I said we're going to cover a lot of ground. So we're going to go from school meals now to mental health. So mental health helps improve learning outcomes of students in crisis contexts. Through ECW funding, the Amal Alliance and Norwegian Refu Refugee Council implement important mental health programs. The next two speakers are Danielle De La Fuente and Sophia, who will tell us more. So Sophia, start us off. Dinia Daniel, Education Cannot Wait is supporting Amal Alliance great program called Colors of Kindness. Could you tell us a bit more about it and what skills students in crisis context learn through this program? Thank you, Sophia, for that excellent question. And let me first thank ECW for this timely convening and their generous support in our work. At Amal Alliance, we believe education is essential for human development. Helping children develop the skills they need, the important life skills like self-efficacy. Children in crisis experience extreme adversity and toxic stress, leading to anxiety, depression, and ultimately to an inability to learn and connect with their peers. This also impacts the ecosystem around them, including teachers and caregivers. Colors of Kindness is a multi-award winning model born out of UNHCR's HEA, a Humanitarian Education Accelerator COVID-19 Challenge. It addresses learning gaps at the very root, providing psychosocial support and social and emotional learning which are necessary as a precursor to learning. Our holistic play-based model teaches mindfulness, coping, and communication strategies, allowing children to learn the foundations for peace, build resilience, and ultimately the core competencies they need to navigate life. Social and emotional learning also teaches teamwork, empathy, creativity, which arguably are the skills employers say will lead to meaningful employment. Now learning these skills at a very young age children grow to be emotionally intelligent adults, which also make them less susceptible to long-term health concerns. Our program is low cost, 
requires minimal training, and uses widely accessible technology, making it simple to implement and easy to scale. Since a little over two years, we've already reached 276,000 children worldwide, and our evidence-based model has proven to improve the well-being of children and teachers. By adapting and localizing the content and aligns with local needs, and has responded to on-the-ground priorities as seen with refugees in Bangladesh, has helped with school retention as seen with settlements in Uganda, and has also helped with nationwide education reforms as seen in Greece. Reflecting on the incredible efforts each of you have already made towards our collective mission, but also recognizing there is a lot to be done, I invite you to renew your commitment to children globally, maybe by giving a fist pump or an elbow nudge to the person next to you. So. <laughs> <laughs> And an important partner in this journey is our youth. So the youth that we co-design with. So Sophia, can you please tell us why working with displaced youth in humanitarian action is so important for the mental health of children and youth? Thank you for this question. And let me reply by telling my own story. One year ago, I was running from Ukraine myself. I was running from the war. I took an evacuation train with not knowing which country I'm going to. The way was so dangerous and so scary that I started to regret from the first moment I left. A few times I was ready to stop and to turn back home. I called my parents and they told me, Sophia, if you escape, our family will have opportunities to join you later. And maybe God can use you to help other Ukrainians abroad. So I left Ukraine, but my heart was still inside. When I came to Romania, I felt like I lost my way. I felt really broken and lonely. Everybody saw in me a refugee who needs help, while I saw in myself a person who needs to act. So when I met the Youth Foundation, it was a great chance to me to act. They told that we can build a community, can make educational activities, provide psychosocial support, and it was a chance for me. After that, situation, situation got totally changed. I was not alone anymore. We are thousands of Ukrainians. I could be helpful. So many people needed my help. And I have found my way. I can raise the awareness about the situation in Ukraine among Europeans. And I also seen how community had the same challenges and how they were changing. They come to visit educational activities, but they were receiving also support mental help. They were founding same friends, same people as they are. And it was a really good psychosocial supporting program. Dear audience, Ukrainians want and can be more than just refugees. We want to be full-fledged part of society. And as a youth worker, we know how to do that. But we need support. Dear audience, your support can change our lives. Thank you. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Thank you, uh, Danielle and Sophia. Danielle, it was funny when we were doing the practice, Danielle was talking about, she was talking about uh, elbow bumping the person to the right of you. And I was trying to picture what that would look like. If everybody went right, it would be like some kind of breakout session line dance or something like that. So I like that you switched up just person next to you. I thought that was a little bit better. So. Um, <laughs> People with disabilities are particularly vulnerable uh, in emergency contexts, and this underlines the importance of inclusive teaching and learning environments. The two next speakers have a lot of lived experience with disabilities and barriers to education, how to overcome them. Let us hear now from Luis Auta, founder of Cedar Seed Foundation, and Vladimir, youth representative from the International Disability Alliance. And Luis is gonna start us off. Thank you so much, Honorable Mike. So over to you, Vladimir. Can you give an example of the barrier facing the inclusion of persons with disabilities in your context and how possible ways to overcome it? Спасибо за вопрос, Лейс. 
Я благодарен судьбе за предоставленную возможность общаться с миром и могу поделиться проблемами людей с инвалидностью в Украине. В моей стране идет война. Это смерть, разрушение, потери, постоянный стресс и сверхчеловеческие усилия, чтобы выжить. Ужасным испытанием война стала для людей с инвалидностью. Основная проблема глухих – это барьеры в общении. Многие думают, если человек не слышит, он ограничен в своих возможностях. Я, как и многие другие, хочу быть успешным и нужным. Хочу приносить радость и пользу окружающим. Хочу, быть, хочу понимать и быть понятым. Своим примером хочу донести всему миру, что барьеры, которые существуют, можно и нужно рушить. Поэтому я призываю вас уделить внимание инклюзивным образовательным программам, потому что каждый человек имеет право на образование. Ключевым фактором доступности образования для людей с потерей слуха выступает наличие перевода образовательного процесса на жестовый язык. Я считаю, что новые цифровые технологии смогут сделать невозможное возможным не только для неслышащих людей, но и для молодежи всего мира. Люди с нарушением слуха смогут быть услышаны не только в своих странах. Я обращаюсь к вам с призывом начать разработку жестового онлайн-переводчика, чтобы облегчить коммуникацию между глухими и слышащими людьми. Это приложение даст возможность каждому человеку в мире получить доступ к качественному инклюзивному образованию и обучению на протяжении всей своей жизни. Я готов создавать новые проекты и программы, которые будут реализованы и сделают жизнь людей лучше. Я искренне верю, что эта встреча – стимул для определения решения и реализации новых идей, задач и планов. Лейс, у меня к вам встречный вопрос. Как успешные инициативы в области инклюзивного образования могут повлиять на жизнь людей с ограниченными возможностями? Thank you, thank you. In Nigeria, close to 90% of children with disabilities are out of school, according to Federal Ministry of Women Affairs. In 2020, UNICEF mentioned that 10.6 children in Nigeria are out of school. On 15 October 2022, to be precise, UNESCO came out with another statistics that we have almost 20 million children out of school in Nigeria. This number is huge. And this number of 15% are children with disabilities. I was affected by polio when I was two. I'm 42 years now, but I see my disability as a blessing and not a cause. I see it as a bridge and not a barricade. I also see my disability as an opportunity to change the world. And that's where inclusive education comes in. The significance and the impact of inclusive education are many. Inclusive systems provide a better quality education for all children and are instrumental in changing discriminatory attitudes. Schools provide the context for a child's first relationship with the world outside their families. Creating an enabling environment in schools provide confidence for children with disabilities. So we want to see more of mainstream schools everywhere in the world than special schools. 
because the impact of inclusive education provides civic participation, it provides employment opportunities, it also gives us the right to become decision makers like Honorable Mike. Persons with disabilities can become members of the parliament, they can become engineers, they can become managers, CEOs, whatever you can call it because of inclusive education. So we want to see government institutions, private and public institutions funding inclusive education through organizations of persons with disabilities. Thank you very much. So Louise, Louise has, has laid the challenge that everyone on this panel is going to run at some point for, for politics at some point, right? Yeah. Is, that, uh, is that the challenge? None of you live in my constituency, so I'm okay with that. Um, <laughs> as long as you're not running against me, it's, uh, it's all good. I'm, I, we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule, so I'm gonna, like, at risk of weighing in, I just wanna weigh in on something Vladimir said. So I uh, talked about the importance of understanding and being understood. And so I have a son that's nonverbal and uh, um, he communicates with a phone, but he has autism, he communicates with one, you know, one word answers, very concrete things sometimes, so he can tell you he wants a Coke or a chicken Caesar salad, but can't articulate oftentimes how he's feeling. And through conversations with people um, with autism who are able to explain what it's like to be autism, uh, have autism, um, oftentimes the explanation is that sort of frustration at people anticipating what it is that they want and not actually paying attention to what it is that they want. And, and one of my learnings, I think, as a parent, as I've kind of walked this life and, and especially had the opportunity to talk to lots of people with um, varying disabilities, varying experiences, is how important it is for me to wait on Jaden to try and read his body language and his, you know, his facial expressions and those kind of things to try and understand what it is that he's trying to say. And, uh, and in terms of the value of inclusion, how it relates to education, I think because he was included in a regular school, he was surrounded by people who had that experience with him and had a chance to get to know him a little bit. And his life is you know, way better, but also other people's lives who will come into contact with those other students who have met someone with autism. Uh, their lives will be better because now they've got some experience having met someone with autism. That's part of the power of inclusion as I think about it. So using the fact that I've got a microphone and I'm a politician and a few minutes to talk, I thought I'd just share that uh, little bit of insight. So, um, but I'm gonna move on because there are, there are uh, two more speakers who have something really important to share. So uh, first of all, thank you, Volodymyr and, and Luis for, uh, for your uh, incredibly valuable insight there. Now. We know that girls and women are particularly vulnerable to violence in emergency contexts. And the next two speakers are Marie Yadamne from Siliaf and Farah from Transform Education, uh, hosted by Angai. And these two organizations support ECW's work to strengthen gender equality in our programming. So Marie, I'm gonna let you uh, take it from here. Oui, merci. Pourriez-vous citer certains risques spécifiques auxquels sont exposées les femmes et les filles dans les situations de crise, chère Farah? Uh, thank you for your question. So, emergencies, whether they're natural disasters, conflict, or humanitarian crises, they have devastating effects on entire communities. But in those communities, girls and women often bear the burden of those. Um, crises in various different aspects. So not only are existing pre-inequalities exacerbated, but girls and women are at high risk of violence, exploitation, abuse, whether it's physical, sexual, or psychological violence. And they're exposed and vulnerable to things like trafficking, forced marriages, and being forced to leave their education. 
Also, access to basic services like healthcare, water, and sanitation services become more limited, which puts them at further risk of health um, problems. And we can see that in Pakistan, after the floods, women had to walk miles from their homes to access pharmacies, and there were um, cases of malaria and dengue increased in so many different communities. And I think it's imperative that we take action to address these risks to protect girls and women, and we must invest in and ensure the provision of appropriate services. And this should be in the form of spaces, safe spaces for women and girls, reproductive health care, and of course, education. It's also important that we work to prevent the violence that they face and hold perpetrators accountable at the same time. Also, I think it's really important that we should recognize that girls, like Sophia said, are not just passive victims in emergencies, but they are active participants in their own survival and their own recovery. And for this, education is key. To protect girls and to empower them, to secure their futures and to create resilient communities. I also just wanted to stress on the urgency required in our reactions to emergency crises. So schools all over the world, as you can see, are still recovering from COVID-19, and some have shut down and will not be opened again. And I was just thinking about this a few days ago, and I want you to think about it as well. How many girls in Pakistan went back to school after the floods? And when will schools in Turkey and Syria be rebuilt and reopened, you know? And to not act with pressure, to be honest, is an act of negligence and an injustice to girls by world leaders and international organizations. Um, entire communities are set back and deprived of their rights as humans and the, the right to develop. And I think that's why we need to address these crises with a sense of urgency and a gender transformation formative lens. And on that note, Marie, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, what have we learned about the link between initiatives to mitigate gender-based violence and the impact of these initiatives on improved learning um, outcomes for girls in emergencies? Merci beaucoup. La cellule des organisations des femmes dans le cadre de la dimension multi sectoriel du système éducatif ainsi que le besoin spécifique des filles et des femmes euh, est aussi inscrit dans la logique de l'éducation qu'en notre way, l'éducation ne peut pas attendre. Donc nous nous occupons des filles et des scolarisées, des femmes en situation difficile, ce sont des femmes retournées, des femmes euh, réfugiées qui euh, dans le cadre de la crise centrafricaine, la crise euh, de, de l'est, de l'ouest du Tchad. Vous savez que le Tchad est un creusé, entouré par des, des situations euh, d'instabilité constante. Et c'est dans ce cadre que nous avions euh, intégré le système éducatif en renforçant les capacités des, des mères d'élèves surtout, euh, en leur appuyant avec des, 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 des renforcements des capacités dans les petits métiers porteurs où elles peuvent facilement euh, agir dans le cadre des activités génératrices de revenus. Et les revenus de ces activités leur permettent d'appuyer la scolarisation de leurs filles, parce que dans des pareilles conditions, les filles étant donc en dehors du système éducatif, il est question de sensibiliser fortement leurs leur mamans. Les mamans surtout qui sont la plupart des cas analphabètes, analphabètes ont besoin d'être alphabétisés, d'où la création des centres d'alphabétisation pour favoriser, donner une réponse à cette, euh, cette culture ancrée dans le chat où les filles et les femmes n'ont pas droit à l'éducation. Maintenant, ces femmes sensibilisées ont elles-mêmes créé des centres d'alphabétisation où elles fréquentent avec les revenus de leur euh, activité génératrice de revenus elles essaient également de prendre en charge les maîtres communautaires. Elles ont fait de fortes sensibilisations au point d'inscrire elles-mêmes leurs filles à l'école, dont le pourcentage d'inscription des filles à l'école a augmenté cette année avec la forte sensibilisation que nous avons eu à faire et l'appui en cash rotatif pour qu'elles ne manquent pas de, de, de moyens financiers. Elles font donc le cash rotatif à tour de rôle. Elles se servent et elles vaquent à leurs occupations économiques qui leur permettent de s'autonomiser. Et dans ce même sillage, la CELEF organise aussi le, la formation dans l'éducation non formelle, parce qu'on ne peut pas laisser les filles à l'écart. 
il va falloir les faire revenir, même dans une éducation. L'éducation n'est pas à 100% formelle, même dans l'apprentissage des petits métiers, ça contribue à la prise en charge de la femme, à son autonomisation, à son pouvoir économique. Et nous avons aussi initié la création des, 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 de la pré-éducation dont des enfants, euh, je parle ici des crèches, où nous avons pris des enfants, des filles réfugiées, des grossesses non désirées qui sont apparues avec les violences sexistes, on est obligé de créer les crèches où nous avions dû déposer les enfants dans les crèches et libérer les filles qui sont plutôt allées à l'école. Ces crèches sont créées à côté des écoles, à côté des écoles dont les filles viennent, elles déposent leurs enfants, où il y a des filles qui, pour des questions culturelles, gardent les filles, à leurs petits frères à la maison et les mamans vont à leur occupation, il est question de déposer les enfants dont vous avez la charge à côté de votre établissement scolaire, et en même temps vous allez en classe. Et en même temps, nous avons les mères d'élèves organisées qui pourvoient à la nourriture de ces petits-enfants. Et à la fin de l'heure, et la petite fille qui devrait être retenue à la maison est obligée de se nourrir avec son petit frère ou même son propre enfant parce que c'est des grossesses précoces et... Des, 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 des accouchements précoces. Et en fin de l'heure, elle rentre chez elle à la maison. Et nous pensons que cet appui nous a été bénéfique dans le cadre où le renforcement des capacités euh, en droit et devoir de la femme, le renforcement des capacités en pouvoir économique, le renforcement des capacités qui a donc créé un déclic qui a favorisé en fait euh, la création des, des centres de couture dans les centres d'écoute que nous avions dû initier, mis en place, ces femmes et ces filles font des, des serviettes hygiéniques, pourquoi pas, renouvelables, qu'elles qu peuvent aussi vendre, elles se confectionnent des habits qu'elles vendent aussi et ça pourvoit à leurs besoins économiques. Donc, en fait, nous pensons que cet appui multiforme des partenaires, tant techniques qu'économiques, peut encore s'accroître dans notre région du Tchad qui est dans la phase de transition, vous le connaissez si bien, et nous avons besoin de cet appui qui puisse donc aider les Tchadiens et les Tchadiennes à s'auto-promouvoir et à reconnaître, à s'assumer en droit et en devoir pour la promotion de l'égalité du genre et la lutte contre la violence basée sur le genre. Je vous remercie. Ah. Merci, merci Marie. Um, can we give one more round of applause to all of the <laughs> panelists here? So in that sort of vein of uh, things do not happen, things are made to happen, we had two sessions ahead of time to kind of go through things. And, uh, you know, it's very clear that every one of these uh, folks up here could speak for 45 minutes on their own and have the room captivated by what they have to say, and uh, yet they're able to focus on what was most important in their message, and I think really worked it out. I was terrified. Moderating a panel with nine people on it uh, um, can be terrifying, but uh, we, we worked it out here. I'm just going to close by just with a few, a few comments. So first of all, I just want to say a huge thanks to ECW. Uh, you know, I, I love working with ECW. Um, Yasmin is a very good friend of mine. I can't think of anybody more action-oriented than Yasmin. She's got just a little bit of passion for uh, what she's working on. And so uh, thank you to the crew from ECW, Jordi, and the rest of the crew from ECW. Can we give them a round of applause? And I don't, I don't know, the technicians, like the technicians uh, who set up all of this stuff and were working out all of the, the videos and the sound and translation, the translators, can we, they don't get enough appreciation, I think, so. And then I'm just gonna say a few words just to kind of close, because this is really important for me to have the opportunity to do this, and I've got three more minutes before we send you off to the, the final session uh, on time, Jordi, so on time. But uh, you know, the, 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 the way that I would sort of frame this in terms of my own thinking, it kind of helps me to kind of get my head around it, because I really am wired for action. I'm really impatient. I think a lot of people in this room are equally impatient for action on some of these things. So now we've, we've raised all this money, and we need action. And 
you know, the way I envision kind of on education, I, I maybe oversimplify a little bit. The goal is to get kids in school, all kids everywhere in the world in school, and then the second part of that goal is that their lives need to be better off because they're in school, right? It's not enough to just to get kids to school, right? They have to improve, their lives need to be improved because they're in school. And I think about people with developmental disability. Getting kids with developmental disability, someone like Jaden when he was six into school, wouldn't be very good if he's just gonna go into school and be bullied. We have to deal with stigma reduction and all of those different things. We've got a big job before, before us, but, but we can do it. Look at these people in the room. Look at the people in front of you right here. Please make sure you make connection with the folks uh, who have just shared with you so that you can work together on some of these things. And then the other thing that I've learned over time is we can't wait for unanimity before we act. We will never have unanimity. We will always have a little bit of difference of opinion. So let's work together to find the common ground, the things that we agree on, and let's act today, tomorrow, on those things that we agree on. Let's move to make people's lives better on the things that we agree on, the areas where we can find common ground. Where we don't have common ground, let's work to establish a consensus. Let's work with people who are like-minded and, uh, and, and cr create action there, but we cannot wait for unanimity before we act. And on that note, I will wrap things up here, encourage you, uh, you got 15 minutes to make some contact here and, and uh, say hello to a few, uh, a few people you know. And with that, uh, thank you so much for including all of us in your couple of days here and uh, enjoy the remainder, I guess, the closing session today. Thanks. C'est déjà pas mal. Il est bien déjà. What are we doing? Oh, we're doing a picture here? Awesome. <laughs> that is the best, that is the best back of a camera I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's do one camera at a time. So this one, one at a time. <laughs> Wait, we want one too. We want one too. We'll see you in the back. Here. Jimmy, no. Go for it. Okay. Okay, so back there now.
Oh. It was so good. Yeah, yeah.